Chapter 21 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 21 A Mystery Explained. Joe Quigley did not deny the accusation. He slumped at the telegraph desk, staring straight before him. Why did you do it? Penny asked. How could you? I don't know. Now, Quigley answered heavily. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Penny shook out the garment. The hole, when worn over one's head, would give the appearance of a sheeted goblin with body cut off at the shoulders. She tore off a long strip of the material and began to wrap Quigley's injured hand. You've known for a long time, haven't you? he asked diffidently. I suspected it, but I wasn't sure. Penny replied. Your style of writing is rather spectacular. Last night, when I saw Trinidad leap the barrier at Sleepy Hollow, I thought I knew. Nothing matters now, Quigley said, self-accusingly. Sleepy Hollow's gone. Don't you think Mrs. Lear and the Burmasters had any chance to reach the hills? I doubt it. When the dam broke, that water raced down that valley with the speed of an express train. Probably they were caught like rats in a trap. It seems too horrible. I knew this would happen, Quigley went on. It was what I fought against. We tried through the Delta Citizens Committee to get Burmaster to help repair the dam before it was too late. You know what luck we had. So, failing in ordinary methods, you tried to bring him around with your headless horseman stunt? It was a foolish idea. Quigley acknowledged. Ms. Lear really put me up to it, not that I'm trying to throw any blame on her. She never liked Mrs. Burmaster, and for good reasons. The Headless Horseman affair started off as a prank, and then I thought I saw a chance to influence the Burmasters that way. At that, he may have come around if it hadn't been for his wife. Yes, she was against the town from the first. She hated everyone. Why, well, she believed that our only thought was to get her away from the valley just to trick her. I guess it doesn't matter now, Penny said. The estate's gone and everyone with it. Somehow, I can't realize it. Things happened so fast. This is a horrible disaster, and it will only be worse if help doesn't get here fast, Quigley replied. Fortunately, the water doesn't seem to be coming any higher. Penny had completed a rough bandaging job on the station agent's hand. Thanking her, he got up to test the two office telephones. Both were out of service. Presently, a message came in over the telegraph wire. It was addressed to Penny and was from her father. Quigley copied it on a pad and handed it to her. Thank God you are safe, the message read. A special circuit will be cut through to Delta Station as soon as possible. Can you give us a complete running story of the flood? Was a running story? Quigley asked curiously. I think Dad wants me to gather every fact I can, Penny explained. He wants a continuous story, enough material to fill a wire for several hours. He'll do it? I don't know, Penny said doubtfully. I've never handled a story as big as this. I've had no experience on anything so important. There's no other person to do it. I want to find Louise, Penny went on, rereading the message. I ought to try to learn what happened to poor Mrs. Lear and the Burmasters. Listen, Quigley argued quietly. You can't do anything for your friends now. Don't you see it's your duty to get news out to the country? Your father expects it of you. Penny remained silent. Don't you realize there's no one else to send the news? Quigley demanded. You probably the only reporter within miles of here. But I'm not really a reporter. I've written stories for Dad's paper, it's true, but not big stories such as this. Red Valley needs help. The only way to get it is by arousing the public. Do I wire your father yes or no? Make it yes, Penny decided. Tell Dad I'll try to have something for him in an hour. She'll need longer than that, Quigley advised. Anyhow, 
It's apt to be several hours before we get a special wire through. While the agent sent the message, Penny searched the office for pencil and paper. She won't go far without shoes, Quigley said over his shoulder. What became of yours? I left them over on the hillside. Well, you can't go back for them now, Quigley replied, gazing ruefully through the window at the racing torrent which separated the station from the high hill. Let's see what we can find for you. He rummaged through the closet and came upon a pair of boots which looked nearly small enough for Penny. We had a boy who wore those when he worked here, he explained. See if they'll do, and here's my coat. Oh, I can't take that, Penny protested. You'll need it yourself. No, I'm sticking here at my post, Quigley answered. I'll be warm enough. He insisted that Penny wear the coat. She left the station and waded toward higher ground. The coat over her drenched clothing offered only slight protection from the chill wind. With the sun dropping low, she knew that soon she would actually suffer from cold. Penny wondered where to start in gathering vital facts for her father. The flood had followed the narrow V-shaped valley, cutting a swath of destruction above Delta and there spreading out to the lowlands. She decided to tour the outlying section of Delta first, view the wreckage, and question survivors. If only salt were here, she thought. Dad would want pictures, but there's no way for me to take them. Keeping to the hillside, Penny reached a high point of land overlooking what had been the town of Delta. Two or three streets remained as before. One of the few business places still standing was the white stone building that housed the local telephone company. Elsewhere, there was only water and scattered debris. Penny headed up the valley, passing and meeting groups of bedraggled refugees who had taken to the hills at the first alarm. She questioned everyone. Nevertheless, definite information eluded her. How many lives had been lost? How great was the property damage? What fate had befallen Mrs. Lear and the Burmasters? No one seemed to know. Half sick with despair, she kept on. She jotted down names and facts. Mr. Bibbs, an old man who ran a weekly newspaper at Delta, was able to help her more than anyone else. Not only did he give her a partial list of the known missing, but he recited many other facts that had escaped Penny. A million thanks, she began gratefully, but he waved her into silence. Just get back to the railroad station and send your story, he urged. Penny lost all count of time as she retraced her way along the muddy hillside. Everywhere she saw suffering and destruction. Her mind was so numbed to the sight that she recorded impressions automatically. It was long after nightfall before Penny reached the station. Every muscle protested as she dragged herself wearily to the doorstep. During her absence, the flood had lowered by nearly a foot. However, the current remained swift, and she steadied herself for a moment against the building wall. "'Who's there?' called Quigley sharply. "'Penny Parker?' "'Okay, come on in,' the agent invited. "'Thought you might be a looter.' Penny pushed open the door. The waiting room was filled with men, women, and children who slumped in cold misery on the uncomfortable row of seats. Few were provided with any warm clothing." Penny splashed through the dark, musty room to the inner office. Quigley had lighted a smoky oil lamp which revealed that he had made himself a bed on top of the telegraph desk. "'I'm turning in for the night,' he explained. "'There's nothing more we can do until morning.' "'How about my story for the Star?' Penny asked wearily. "'Is the special wire set up yet?' "'Don't make me laugh,' Quigley replied. The dispatcher's wire went out for good an hour ago. Too bad you killed yourself to get that story, because you just have to wait. But it mustn't wait, Penny protested. Dad's counting on me. I gave my promise. How about the telephone company? Their lines are all down. Western Union? It's the same with them. Repair crews are on their way here, but it'll take time. The valley's completely cut off from communication. For how long? Listen, Penny, you know about as much as I do. The airfields are underwater. How about the roads? Hoping only part of the way. 
Completely discouraged, Penny sagged into a chair by the ticket counter. She was wet through, plastered with mud, hungry and tired enough to collapse. After all of her work and suffering, her efforts had been in vain. By morning, experienced city reporters would be swarming into the valley. Her scoop would be no scoop at all. Oh, brace up, Quigley encouraged carelessly. But I've failed Dad. It would mean a lot to him to get an exclusive story of this disaster. I gave him my promise I'd send the facts, and now I've failed. It's not your fault the wire couldn't be set up, Quigley tried to encourage her. Here, I managed to get a hold of a blanket for you. Wrap up in it and grab some sleep. You'll need your strength tomorrow. I guess you're right, Penny acknowledged gloomily. Taking off the muddy boots, she rolled herself into the warm blanket. Curling up into the chair, she pillowed her head on the desk and slept the untroubled sleep of complete exhaustion. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adams, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 22 Wanted A Wire. Toward morning, Penny awoke to find her limbs stiff and cramped. Murky, fetid water still flowed over the floor of the station. However, it had lowered during the night, leaving a rim of oozy mud to mark the office walls. The first ray of light streamed through the broken window. Penny yawned and stretched her cramped feet. She felt wretched and dirty. Her clothing was stiff and caked with mud. She scraped off what she could and washed her face and hands in a basin of water she found at the back end of the room. When she returned, Joe Quigley was awake. My neck, my arm, my whole anatomy, he complained, rubbing a hand over his stubbly beard. I'm a cripple for life. I feel the same way, Penny grinned. I'm hungry, too. Anything to eat around here? Not a crumb. The folks out in the waiting room broke into all the vending machines last night. There's not so much as a piece of candy left. And there's no place in Delta where food can be bought. Not that I know of. Only a few relief kitchens were set up last night. They can't begin to take care of the mob. Penny peered out into the crowded waiting room. Mothers with babies in their arms had sat there all night. Some of the refugees were weeping. Others accepted their lot with stoical calm. Seeing such misery, Penny forgot her own hunger and discomfort. Don't you think help will come soon? she asked Quigley. Hard to tell, he replied. It should. Penny went out into the waiting room, but there was very little she could do to help the unfortunate sufferers. She gave one of the women her blanket. That was foolish of you, Quigley told her a moment later. You likely need it yourself. I'd rather go without, Penny replied. Anyway, I can't bear to stay here any longer. I'm going to the telephone office. Why there? The building stands high and should be one of the first places to reopen, Penny declared hopefully. Maybe I can get a long-distance call through to Dad. Better leave some of your story with me, advised Quigley. If we get a wire before the telephone company does, I'll try to send it for you. Penny scribbled a hundred-word message, packing it solidly with facts. If ever it reached Riverview, a star rewrite man could enlarge it to at least a column. Saying goodbye to Joe, Penny made her way toward all that remained of Delta's business section. She had not seen Louise since the previous afternoon and was greatly worried about her. I know she's safe, she told herself, but I must find her. Penny was not alone on the devastated streets. Refugees wandered aimlessly about, seeking loved ones or treasured possessions. Long lines of shivering people waited in front of a church that had been converted into a soup kitchen. Penny joined the line. Just as a woman handed her a steaming cup of hot broth, she heard her name spoken. 
Turning quickly, she saw Louise running toward her from across the street. Penny! Penny! her chum cried joyfully. Careful! Penny cautioned, balancing the cup of soup. This broth is as precious as gold. Oh, you poor thing! cried Louise, hugging her convulsively. You look dreadful. That's because I'm so hungry, Penny laughed. Have you had anything to eat? Oh, yes, I stayed at that farmhouse on the hill last night. I actually had a bed to sleep in and a good hot breakfast this morning. But I've been dreadfully worried about you. And that goes double, answered Penny. Wait until I gobble this soup and we'll compare notes. She drank the broth greedily, and the girls walked away from the church. Penny told of her experiences since leaving her chum on the hillside. Louise was much relieved to learn that word had been sent to Riverview of their safety. "'But what about Mrs. Lear and the Burmasters?' she asked anxiously. "'Have you heard what happened to them?' Penny shook her head. "'Joe Quigley thinks they didn't have a chance.' "'I can't comprehend it somehow.' Louise said with a shudder. It just doesn't seem possible. Why, we were guests in Mrs. Lear's home less than 24 hours ago. I know, agreed Penny soberly. I keep hoping that somehow they escaped. If only we could learn the truth. There is not a chance to get through now, Penny said slowly. The water's gone down a little, but not enough. If we had a boat... The current is still so swift we couldn't handle it. I suppose not, Louise admitted hopelessly. When do you suppose the relief folks will get here? They should be moving in at any time, and when they come, they'll probably be trailed by a flock of reporters and photographers. This flood will be a big story, Louise acknowledged. Big? It's one of the greatest news stories of the year, and here I am, helpless to send out a single word of copy. You mean that folks outside the valley don't know about the flood? Louise gasped. The news went out, but only as a flash. Before we could give any details, our only wire connection was lost. Then the first reporter to get his news out of the valley will have a big story. That's the size of it. Penny nodded. The worst of it is, is that Dad's depending on me. But he can't expect you to do the impossible. If there are no wire connections, it's not your fault. Anyhow, as soon as one is set up, you'll be able to send your story. Other reporters will be here by that time. Experienced men. Maybe they'll get the jump on me. I'll venture they won't, Louise said with emphasis. You've never failed yet on a story. This is more than a story, Lou. It's a great human tragedy. Somehow, I don't feel a bit like a reporter. I just feel bewildered and rather stunned. You're tired and half sick, Louise said. She linked arms with Penny and guided her away from the long line of refugees. Where to? she asked after they had wandered for some distance. I was starting for the telephone company when I met you. Why the telephone office? Louise asked. Well, it's high and dry. I thought that by some chance they might have a wire connection. Then let's go there by all means, urged Louise. Farther down the debris-clogged street, the girls came to the telephone company offices. The building, one of the newest and tallest in Delta, had been gutted by the flood. However, the upper floors remained dry and emergency quarters had been established there. Nearly all employees were at their posts. Penny and Louise pushed their way through the throng of refugees that had taken possession of the lower floor. Climbing the stairs to the telephone offices, they asked to see the manager. Mr. Nordwall is not seeing anyone, they were informed. He is very busy. Penny persisted. She explained that her business was urgent and concerned getting a news story through to Riverview. After a long delay, she was allowed to talk to the manager, a harassed, overworked man named Nordwall. "'Please state your case briefly,' he said wearily. Penny explained again that she wished to get a story of the flood through to her father's paper and asked what hope there was. "'Not much, I'm afraid.' the man replied we haven't a single toll line at present 
How soon do you expect to get one? The manager hesitated, unwilling to commit himself. By noon, we may have one wire west, he said reluctantly. Penny asked if she could have first chance at it. Nordwall regretfully shook his head. Relief work must come before news. Then there's no way to get my story out? I suggest you place your call in the usual way, Mr. Nordwall instructed. I'll tell our long-distance chief operator to put it ahead of everything else except relief work messages. Penny obeyed the manager's suggestion. However, she and Louise both knew that there was only a slight chance the call would go through in time to do any good. No use waiting around here, Penny said gloomily. The wire won't even be set up before noon. Leaving the telephone building, the girls sloshed back toward the railroad. Suddenly, Louise drew Penny's attention to an airplane flying low overhead. It flew so close to the ground that they could read United Press on the wings. Well, it looks as if the newsboys are moving in, Penny observed, probably taking photographs of the flood. The airplane circled Delta and then vanished eastward. Walking on, the girls met an armed soldier who passed them without a glance. The National Guard, Penny commented. That means a road is open. And it means that help is here at last, Louise cried. Property will be protected now and some order will be established. Penny remained silent. Aren't you glad? Louise demanded, staring at her companion. Yes, I'm glad, Penny said slowly. I truly am, but the opening of the road means that within a very little while every news service in the country will have men here. And you've lost your chance to send an exclusive story to the star. I've let Dad down, Penny admitted. He depended upon me, and I failed him miserably. End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of Hoof Beats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 23, Toll Line to Riverview. Penny and Louise trudged slowly on to the railroad tracks. They were too discouraged for much conversation and avoided speaking of Mrs. Lear or the Burmasters. Sleepy Hollow had been washed away but no one could tell them what had happened to the unfortunate ones caught in the valley. It doesn't matter now, Penny said dispiritedly, but I do know who masqueraded as the headless horseman, Joe Quigley. The station agent? Yes, he told me about it last night. Of course, Mrs. Lear let him use her horse, and no doubt she encouraged him in the idea. They did it to plague the Burmasters. Joe thought he could bring Mr. Burmaster around to his way of thinking about the Huntley Dam. How stupid everyone was, Louise sighed. If it hadn't been for Mrs. Burmaster's stubbornness, her husband might have given the money to save the dam. Then this dreadful disaster would have been prevented. Penny nodded absently. Her gaze was fixed on a stout man just ahead who wore climbing irons on his heavy shoes. She nudged Louise. See that fellow? Why, yes, what about him? I'm sure he's a telephone lineman. Probably he's working on the line by the railroad. Probably, Louise agreed, without much interest. Come on, Penny urged, quickening her pace. Let's talk to him. The girls overtook the workman and fell into step. Penny questioned him and readily learned that he was working close by at the washed-out railroad bridge. We're aiming to shoot a wire across the river the linemen volunteered. It's going to be one tough little job. Mind if we go along? Penny asked eagerly. It's okay by me, the telephone man consented. Hard walking, though. Floodwaters had receded from the railroad right-of-way, leaving a long stretch of twisted rails and slimy roadbed. They waded through the mud, soon coming to the break where the bridge had swung aside. Debris of every variety had piled high against the wrecked steel structure. Flood water boiled through a gap at a furious rate. I don't see how they'll ever get a cable across there, Penny commented dubiously. 
Coast Guard men are helping us. They'll shoot it over with a Lyle gun, we hope. Penny and Louise wandered through the gap in the roadbed. On both shores, line men and cable splicers were hard at work. Coast Guardsmen already had set up their equipment, and all was in readiness to shoot a cable across the river. Okay, let her go, rang out the terse order. Stand clear! A Coast Guardsman raised the Lyle gun. Making certain that the steel wire would run free, he released the trigger. The weighted cable flashed through the air in a beautiful arc only to fall short of its goal. Not enough allowance for the wind, the guardsman said in disgust. We'll need a heavier charge. The gun was reloaded, and again the wire spun from its spool. Again it fell short of the far shore by three feet. Undaunted by failure, the men tried once more. This time the aim was true, and the heavy powder charge carried rod and cable to its mark. They've done it, Penny cried jubilantly. Now it shouldn't be long before we can get a wire connection with the outside world. Immediately, telephone company men seized the flexible cable, anchoring it solidly. Heavy cables were then drawn across and made fast, permitting a courageous lineman in a bosun's chair to work high above the turbulent river. If that cable should break, he'd be lost, Louise said with a shudder. It makes me jumpy just to watch him. Fearlessly, the man accomplished his task, suspending a temporary emergency telephone line. Cable splicers promptly carried the ends of the new cable to terminal boxes. So absorbed was Penny in watching the task that for a time she forgot her own urgent need of a message wire. But as she observed the men talking over a test phone, the realization suddenly came to her that a through wire had been established west from Red Valley. Lou, they've done it, she exclaimed. The wire connection is made. It does look that way. If only I could use that test set to get my news story through to Dad. Fat chance. I'd still be the first to get out the story, Penny went on excitedly. It will do no harm to ask, anyhow. Breaking away from Louise, she sought the lineman of her acquaintance. Eagerly, she broached her request. Not a chance to use that line, sister, he answered impatiently. Our lines are for testing purposes only. But this is a very great emergency. Sorry, the line man brought her up short. You'll have to put your call through the regular channels. Regulations. Baffled by the cold refusal, Penny turned away. Even though she knew the telephone man had no authority to grant her request, she was nonetheless annoyed. This is enough to drive one mad, she complained to Louise. It may be hours before the downtown telephone office will offer toll service. Well, it does no good to fret about it, her chum shrugged. There's nothing you can do. I'm not so sure about that, Penny muttered. Her attention had been drawn to a man in a gray business suit who was talking earnestly to the fireman of the line gang. That's Mr. Nordwall, she announced. Again, abandoning Louise, she pushed through the throng of spectators. Touching the man's arm to attract his attention, she said, Mr. Nordwall, do you remember me? He gazed at her without recognition. I am Penny Parker. I want to send a message through to my father. Oh, yes, now I remember, the telephone company manager exclaimed. You were trying to send a call through to Riverview. Is there any reason why I can't use the phone now, the test instrument? Such a procedure would be very irregular. But it would save hours in getting my story through, Penny went on quickly. Hundreds of persons are desperately in need of food and shelter. If the public can be aroused by newspaper publicity, funds will be subscribed generously. Mr. Nordwall, you must let me send my story. Well, this is a very great emergency, the manager agreed. I'll see what can be done. Penny waited, scarcely daring to hope. However, Mr. Nordwall kept his word. To the delight of the girls, the call was put through. Within ten minutes, Penny was summoned to the test box. You have your connection with Riverview, she was told. Go ahead. Penny raised the receiver to her ear. Her hand trembled. She was so nervous and excited. She spoke tensely into the transmitter. 
Hello, is this the Star Office? Anthony Parker speaking, said the voice of her father. Dad, this is Penny. I have the story for you. She heard her father's voice at the other end of the line, but it became so weak she could not distinguish a word, nor could he understand her. The connection had failed. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 24 A Big Story. Penny despaired, fearing that she could never make her father understand what she had to tell him. Then, Unexpectedly, the wire trouble cleared, and Mr. Parker's voice fairly boomed into her ear. "'Is that you, Penny? Are you all right?' "'Oh, yes, Dad,' she answered eagerly. "'And so is Louise. We have the story for you. Couldn't get it out before.' "'Thought we'd never hear from you again,' Mr. Parker said, his voice vibrant. "'Your flash on the flood scooped the country.' We're still ahead of the other newspapers. Shoot me all the facts. Penny talked rapidly but distinctly. Facts had been imprinted indelibly on her memory. She had no need to refer to notes except to verify names. Now and then, Mr. Parker interrupted to ask a question. When the story had been told, he said crisply, You've done marvelously, Penny, but we'll need more names. Get as complete a list of the missing as you can. I'll try, Dad and pictures. So far, all we have are a few airplane shots of the flooded valley. Can you get hold of a camera? I doubt it, Penny said dubiously. Well, try anyhow, her father urged. And keep on the lookout for Salt Summers. He's on his way there now with two reporters. They're bringing in a portable wire photo set. Then you plan to send flood pictures direct from here to Riverview? That's the setup, Mr. Parker replied. If you can get the pictures and have them waiting, we'll beat every other paper in the country. I'll do my best, Penny promised, but it's a hard assignment. She talked a moment longer before abandoning the test phone to one of the linemen. Seeking Louise, she repeated the conversation. But how can we get a camera? Her chum asked hopelessly. Delta's stores are underwater, most of them at least. Though the situation seemed impossible, the girls tramped from one debris-clogged street to another. After an hour's search, they came upon a man who was snapping pictures with a box camera. Questioned by Penny, he agreed to part with it for twenty dollars. "'I haven't that many cents,' Penny admitted. "'But my father is owner of the Riverview Star, and I'll guarantee that you'll receive your money later.' "'How do I know I'll ever see you again?' You don't, said Penny. You'll just have to trust me. Oh, ye yeah, look honest, the man agreed after a pause. I'll take a chance. He gave Penny the camera together with three rolls of film. The girls carefully wrote down his name and address. Now to get our pictures, Penny said, as she and Louise started on once more. We'll take a few of the streets, then I want to get some human interest shots. How about the railroad station? louise suggested a great many of the refugees are being cared for there penny nodded assent hastening toward the depot they paused several times to snap pictures they thought were especially suitable for newspaper reproduction along the railroad right-of-way crews of men were hard at work but it was evident that it would be days before train service could be resumed penny and louise went into the crowded waiting room of the depot Joe Quigley had locked himself into the inner office, but even there he was surrounded by a group of argumentative young men. Reporters, Penny observed alertly. I knew it wouldn't take them long to get here. The newspaper men were bombarding Quigley with questions, demanding to know when and how they could send out their newspaper copy. I can't help you boys, he said regretfully. It'll be two hours at least before we have wire service. Better try the telephone company. Just then, one of the newspaper men spied Penny and her camera. Immediately, he hailed her. The other reporters flocked about the two girls, offering to buy any of the films at fancy prices. Sorry, Penny declined. My pictures are earmarked for the Riverview Star. 
What, didn't you hear? One of the men bantered. Their wire photo car broke down just this side of Hobostein. The star won't move in here before night. By then, your pictures will be old stuff. Better sell to us, urged another. Penny shook her head. She wasn't sure whether or not the men were joking. In any case, she meant to hold her pictures until her father released them. Between Hobostein and Delta, there was only one highway over which a car could pass. The arrival of newspaper men led Penny to believe that this road now was open. Dad told me to keep a sharp watch for Salt Summers, she said to Louise. Let's post ourselves by the road where we can see incoming cars. What about the pictures we plan to take here? I do want to snap one or two, Penny admitted. It's embarrassing, though, just walk up to a group and ask to take a picture. As the girls debated, the door swung open. Into the already crowded room stumbled a new group of refugees. Suddenly, Penny's gaze fastened upon a haggard woman who looked grotesque in a man's overcoat many sizes too large for her. The face was half buried in the high collar, and she could not see it plainly. Then the woman turned, and Penny recognized her. Mrs. Burmaster, she cried. The woman stared at the two girls with leaden eyes. She did not seem to recognize them. Oh, we're so glad you're safe, Penny cried, rushing to her. Your husband? Mrs. Burmaster's lips moved, but no sound came. She seemed stunned by what she had gone through. Do you know what happened to Mrs. Lear? Penny asked anxiously. Have you heard? Even then, Mrs. Burmaster did not speak, but a strange light came into her eyes. Tell me, Penny urged, please. Her words seemed to penetrate the befogged mind of the dazed woman. Mrs. Burmaster's lips moved slightly. Penny bent closer to hear. Mrs. Lear is dead, the woman whispered. She was... she was drowned when... End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Five of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Scowhegan, Maine, two thousand sixteen. Chapter Twenty Five Mission Accomplished. The information shocked Penny. Mrs. Lear? Dead? she repeated. Oh, I was hoping that somehow she escaped. She would have if it hadn't been for me, Mrs. Burmaster said dully. Ten minutes before the dam gave way, a telephone warning was sent out. Mrs. Lear thought my husband and I might not have heard it. She rode her horse to Sleepy Hollow, intending to warn us. And then what happened? Just as Mrs. Lear reached our place, the wall of water came roaring down the valley. We all ran out of the house, hoping to reach the hills. We did get to higher ground, but we saw we couldn't make it. Mrs. Lear made my husband and I climb into a tree. Before she could follow us, the water came. Mrs. Lear was swept away. Yes, we saw her struggling, and then the water carried her beyond sight. Mrs. Burmaster covered her face. Oh, it was horrible, and to think that it was all my fault where is your husband now penny inquired kindly outside i think mrs burmaster murmured we were brought here together in a boat penny and louise went outdoors and after a brief search found mr burmaster his clothing was caked with mud his face was unshaven and he looked years older to his wife's story he could add little this has been a dreadful shock he told penny now that it's too late i realize what a stubborn fool i was my wife and i are responsible for mrs lear's death no no you mustn't say that 
Penny tried to comfort him. It, it was impossible for anyone to predict what would happen. Sleepy Hollow is gone, completely washed away, Mr. Burmaster went on bitterly. That estate cost me a fortune. But you can rebuild. I never shall. My wife could never be happy in Red Valley. Now that this terrible thing has occurred, it would be intolerable to remain. I've been thinking matters over. I've decided to deed all the land I bought back to the valley folk. It's the least I could do to right a great wrong. That would be very generous of you, said Penny, her eyes shining. The girls talked with Mr. Burmaster for a little while and then started toward U.S. Highway 20, intending to watch incoming cars. Ambulances, army, and supply trucks now were flowing into Delta in a steady stream. However, midway there, they spied a car coming toward them which bore Riverview Star on its windshield. There's salt now, Penny cried, signaling frantically. The car stopped with a jerk. The star photographer sat behind the wheel, while beside him were two men from the paper's news department. Well, well, Salt greeted the girls jovially. He swung open the car door. If it isn't Penny, the child wonder, meet Roy Daniels and Joel Wiley. Acknowledging the introduction, Penny and Louise squeezed into the front seat of the sedan. Driving on, Salt plied them with questions. Penny told him how rival newsmen had tried to buy her camera pictures. Good for you, hanging on to them, Salt approved warmly. Our car never did break down. By the way, where can we set up our portable wire photo equipment? There's only one possibility, the telephone company. Right now, they have the only wire service in Delta. Penny directed Salt through the few streets that were clear of debris to the telephone building. There, the portable wire photo equipment quickly was set up. Penny's camera pictures were developed, and though some of the shots were overexposed, there were four good enough to send out over the network. Mr. Nordwall has six toll lines out of Delta now, Salt told the girls jubilantly. He's letting us have one of them. Carefully, the photographer tested the controls of the wire photo machine. He listened briefly to the hum of the motor, Satisfied that everything was running properly, he attached one of the freshly printed pictures to the transmitting cylinder. Okay, he signaled to Mr. Nordwall. Give us a toll to the Riverview Star. Within a few minutes, the order came. Network clear. Go ahead, Delta. Salt turned on a switch and the sending cylinder began to revolve. One by one, Penny's pictures were transmitted over the wire. Your shots are the first to get out of Red Valley, Salt told her triumphantly. Your work's done now. Better crawl off somewhere and sleep. Penny nodded wearily. She was glad to know that the star would scoop every other paper in the country on the flood story and pictures. Still, for some reason, she couldn't feel very happy about it. As she turned away, Salt called. Hey, wait! Your father's on the wire photo phone. He wants to talk to you. Penny caught up the receiver eagerly. That you, Penny? A blurred voice asked in her ear. Congratulations, you came through with flying colors. I guess I was lucky to come through at all, Penny said slowly. Some weren't so fortunate. Just now, the important thing is, is when are you coming home? Mr. Parker asked. Can you get here today? To Penny, the thought of home and a soft bed was more alluring than any other earthly bliss. I'll certainly try, Dad, she promised. Yes, somehow I'll get there. After Penny ended the conversation with her father, she and Louise talked to Salt about the prospects of a trip home. Regretfully, he explained that with a big story to cover, he probably would not be leaving that day. But there are plenty of cars going out of here. He encouraged them. Why not go down to the depot and make inquiries? The idea seemed an excellent one. At the station, the girls talked again with Joe Quigley, who assured them that he knew of a car that was leaving very shortly. Hurry out to Highway 20 and I think you can catch the fella, he urged. Hastily saying goodbye not only to Joe, but to Mr. and Mrs. Burmaster, who remained in the crowded station, the girls went outside. 
As they rounded a corner of the building, a voice fairly boomed at them. Hello, folks! Penny and Louise whirled around to see Silas Malcolm coming toward them. Clinging to his arm was a spry little woman in a borrowed coat and hat. Mrs. Mrs. Lear! Lear! gasped the girls in one voice. It takes more than a flood to wash me away, chirped the old lady, bright as a cricket. Penny and Louise rushed to embrace her. Eagerly, they plied her with questions. I'm just like a cat with nine lives, old Mrs. Lear chuckled. When the flood carried me off, I didn't give up, not me. I was a pretty good swimmer as a gal, and I ain't so bad even now. I kind of went with the current until I got a hold of a log. There I clung till a Red Cross boat picked me up. Mrs. Lear's safe arrival at Delta thrilled Penny and Louise. They rushed into the station to bring Mr. and Mrs. Burmaster, who shared their great relief over the rescue. And Penny was delighted when Mr. Burmaster repeated to the old lady what he had told her, that he intended to allow his property to revert to the former tenants. "'That's mighty good of you, Mr. Burmaster,' the old lady thanked him. "'What we've been through has taught us all a bitter lesson. I'm ashamed of the way I acted.' "'You were justified in your attitude,' the estate owner acknowledged. "'No, I wasn't. It was childish of me trying to take my spite out on your wife.' I'm especially sorry about the way I egged Joe Quigley onto that headless horseman trick. I was afraid you were behind it, smiled Mr. Burmaster. Oh, well, it all seems trivial now. We'll forget everything. There are some things, said Penny quietly, that I doubt we'll ever erase from our minds. She turned to the old lady and asked, Won't you come to Riverview with Louise and me? You'll need a place to stay. Mrs. Lear's gaze met hers, challengingly, but with a twinkle of humor. "'And what better place could I have than this?' she demanded with quiet finality. "'Red Valley is my home, and my home it will be till the end o' time.'" End of chapter 25 End of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson